And he had to explain that he more or less grew up with it. And you'll understand that when I read a bit from my preface, which explains how I got into this. The, the preface is called My Story, or why it has taken me over 30 years to write this book. I think that I must have become a feminist at the age of about eight, when I realised that my mother did not have any money of her own, but had to ask my father for every penny, even to buy him a birthday present. He was kind and gentle, but inevitably he controlled the money. My next experience was in the mid-1960s, when as a young, married, working woman, who believed that marriage was a way of proving how mature and responsible I was, I received my first tax return. This stated that if you were a married woman, you must pass the tax return to your husband for him to fill in on your behalf, to which you would have to tell him any financial secrets that you may have had, and the reciprocal of which was not required. And of course, any rebate is probably to him. And anyway, I was the one who carried out the financial administration for both of us. So, I assumed that as a, a working married woman in the period between jobs when I had no earnings, I would be eligible for unemployment benefit. However, I was rejected on the grounds that I had made myself unemployed by resigning from my school teaching post at the end of the school year, which was the responsible thing to do. But it left a month before my next job started. I was told that it was up to my husband to keep me. I was incensed. I had not included the possibility of being a financial dependent into my vision of happy marriage. At that time, a married woman could elect to have separate assessment for taxation on her earnings, but not on any other income. This remained the case until married couples became entitled to be taxed separately, starting in the fiscal year 1990 to 1991. For some of that, that is within living memory. I did not think... Annie. Could you lift the mic just a little bit for the people next door, just so we can hear you a little louder? Sorry. Is that better? I won't read that all over again. <laughs> I, did not, I did not think much of either the social security or income tax systems, especially for married women, and started thinking about alternatives. I remember talking about the concept of a social dividend with a friend over breakfast one morning in 1970 who pointed me in the direction of Henry George's progress in poverty. In, my mid in the mid-1970s, my husband and I separated. People asked why I had got married in the first place, since I knew what I would be letting myself in for. But obviously, I was ignorant. So I wanted to explore where it said in the marriage laws that women have to be treated as second-class citizens. So I bought a copy of the Marriage Act, which turned out to be a leaflet, merely stating who could marry whom, where, and by whom. I noticed that it said Chapter 15 on the front, so I returned to HMSO and asked for the rest of it. The man laughed and explained that Chapter 15 referred to the fact it was the 15th piece of legislation going through Parliament that year. So I asked how I could find out about how marriage laws determined the role of women in marriage. He opened a very thick tome, which was an index of all the Acts of Parliament, and looked up marriage. They followed several pages, each comprising three columns of small print, listing acts that marriage affected or was affected by. It seemed that the only way in which people could learn in advance about to what they were committing themselves was to do a three-year PhD on the subject. <laughs> When men and women commit matrimony, they rarely know what the contract says. Not only that, but the small print can change over time too. The key lies in the fact that the marriage contract is not a contract between the husband and wife, as many assume. It is between the couple and the state, in which the couple agree to animate, that's a good Scots word, meaning to feed, or in this case to maintain each other, relieving the state from, response, from the responsibility of having to support the former partner. At the same time, this deprives the poorer partner from any state benefits, unless the other partner agrees to a joint application. In this condition lies the bane of married women. So I think you can understand that I've come to this 
through the women's movement, not so much the movement, just my, my own feelings about the, how women are treated in society. And we still, we still have this condition. Um, before I get on to particular details, let me say um, that the, my motivation for a basic income starts with the question, what sort of society do we want to create for ourselves and future generations? And it's this that, um, that pushes me. Now, there are certain objectives that a basic income could help to fulfil and you can decide whether you agree with them or not. Um, I would like each person to be valued for his or her own sake, not just for the work they do or the money they've got. A basic income grants financial privacy and autonomy. Financial independence emancipates and empowers adults, reduces unequal power relationships, and gives more choice over life decisions. The second objective is that a basic income can help to prevent or at least reduce income poverty and provide financial security. In the long run, it could increase well-being in terms of security, health and educational opportunities, helping people to develop to their full potential. A basic income could help to redistribute income and heal our divided society. But by itself, it would not reduce very much the inequalities between rich and poor, men and women, and geographically. For this to be achieved, it would have to be financed by a restructured income tax system. Eventually, it could help to create a united and inclusive society. Fourthly, non-means testing of benefits restores the incentive to work for pay provided by the wage rate, reducing the current high marginal deduction from potential earnings. Because when low-income people or people uh, who are unemployed or on low incomes um, start earning more, not only do they have their income tax uh, withdrawn, uh, deducted, and their employees' national insurance contributions, but any benefit that they receive, their withdrawal rates are aggregated, and it can mean that they could face up to a 96% withdrawal rate. Most of them don't meet that. Most of them are only between 75 and 80. Notice I say only, and yet it's a very regressive system because the highest uh, paid people only pay 40% um, 40 uh, 40 tax and 2% national insurance, or the highest ones is 45% and 2% income. So you can see it's highly regressive that poorer people are facing far more greater deductions from income than, and earnings than uh, higher income people do. Um, a basic income can reduce the inequality of power, power relationships in the workplace and workers and their representatives can negotiate for reasonable pay and better working conditions. And the system would work well in either a full employment economy, if we ever had one again, and one affected by loss of jobs via automation. So it could lead to more efficient and flexible labour markets. The fifth uh, aspect of society that a basic income could help would be to simplify the administration of the social security system, reducing the risk of fraud or error by either recipient or staff. It should also reduce the current time-consuming personal effort and stress required to advocate to apply for evidence, benefits. Eventually, it could lead to a more transparent and accountable system. Um, I remember someone, uh, a tax consultant, thinking that he could help people who apply for benefits, and he was astounded to find that the uh, the application form for benefits was far longer than for tax returns, lead, leading to about 56 pages. And this has to be filled in every time an applicant's circumstances change. And there can be four different agencies that they had to apply to. This has changed with universal credit, and if they just stuck to that, it might have been a bit of an improvement. But they have opted for um, really fierce conditionality and savage sanctions, which changes the the game completely, but it's still not nothing like, still wouldn't have been anything like a basic income. So I'm sure you're asking, well, what is this basic income? Well, let's let's uh, define it. A basic income is a system of cash transfer payments with key features. First of all, it is uh, the assessment and delivery is based on the individual. As I've said before, if people applying for application, applying for benefits, 
then they have to make joint applications. And this is very unfair, especially if the benefits are applied to just one party of the couple. And usually it's the woman who gets uh, left out. And there are probably several million people in this country who don't have an income of their own. And we uh, castigate other countries and say they don't treat their women properly. We don't treat women properly here either. Um, it's a, the basic income is also universal uh, to everyone who has the legal right to reside in the country and who fulfills a residency condition prior to receipt of the basic income. Very specifically, the amount would not be means tested either on the recipient's own income or wealth on that of another family member or household member. And this should avoid the high marginal deduction rates and punitive disincentive effects facing low paid workers. And further, it's not selective, except that the amount could be age related, because usually we assume that children would get less than adults. And there are situations where pensioners could get more than working age adults. But that can change depending on the type of system. But the things that are precluded from a basic income are housing costs. Because of the variability of housing costs and rent across the country, there's no way we can include a fair element in the basic income to cover housing costs. In some parts of the country, it would be like a windfall from the lottery. In other parts, it would be barely enough to cover their living, let alone house, high housing costs, such as in London, or even in Edinburgh, which has got high prices compared with the rest of Scotland. And also, we would make sure that people with disabilities would keep their benefits. And it's a different system. People with disabilities, it's a need-based system, not a means-based system. So people will get their basic income, and then they would get their disability benefits in the normal way. And uh, it should be made sure that no people with disabilities would be worse off as a result. I said that um, the basic income is in the, based on the individual, it's universal, it's not means-tested, it's not selective. And the fifth, re the fifth condition is that it's unconditional. People would not have to jump through hoops to get it. Uh, at the moment, it, they, well, the condition used to be having to be available for work. And since, um, I'm not sure when it started, probably under the coalition government, it's become that people have to provide evidence that they've been searching for a job for 35 hours a week. And the sanctions can be really savage because even a slight misdemeanor, like being five minutes late for a job interview at the job center, um, could lead to the loss of two weeks of benefits. I don't know what people think that people are going to live on. They don't have, people in this situation don't have savings, um, and they've got nowhere to, uh, to call to. And there's a big increase in the use of food banks, and it's often not realized that you can only go to um, a food bank three times in a given time period, which I think is three months, and you can get three days worth of food for you and your family. That leaves a lot of days in the month when you've got to rely on friends or you just go hungry. Um, it really is very, very unfair. I don't like people being treated like this. Um, prisoners get three meals a day, and yet the crime of being poor is running the risk of destitution, which in the end can lead to, um, to death, a shortening of your life um, compared with wealthy people. And that's not the sort of price I want to pay and sort of society I want. Lastly, a basic income would be delivered regularly and automatically to those who qualify, including the responsible parent of a dependent child as now. This is the basis of um, the, the idea of basic income. And one of the things I do in the book is show how these, what I call features of an income maintenance system or social security system, how they relate to achieving the objectives. Other people can sometimes criticize it and say, well, if you want to reduce poverty, you can do it in other ways. Yes, you can, but you can't do all of those things, all those objectives that I uh, listed unless you have complete changes. If you just increase the benefit amounts, you still don't help the condition of women. If you don't stop the means testing, you still have people facing disincentives to work. You need all of these changes to bring about a decent society. Um, 
one of the in the in the, the first main section of the book, I spent quite a lot of time spelling out the sort of thing I've just been telling you. In the next major part, it's the tone changes because. What I'm trying to do is show people how you can actually design a basic income scheme. And one of the questions you have to ask first of all is, well, how much should it be? Excuse me. A lot of people don't seem to realize that we have uh, the European Union's official poverty benchmark which is defined as 0.6, don't write this down if you're taking notes, it's in the book, 0.6 of median equivalent household income. Uh, the important bit is that the UK government has signed up to this in the Child Poverty Action of 2010. So why aren't we all asking our MPs, why aren't our, uh, bench why aren't our benefits matching up to the poverty benchmark? At the moment, the job seeker's allowance is for an adult is £73.10 a week plus housing benefit. If they were paid according to the EU poverty benchmark, then it would be about £140 a week. Uh, occasionally, um, MPs have been challenged to see if they can live on their current um, working age benefit. And it's gone down, so it used to be uh, more than that. And I remember one or two tried and they lasted for five days. Uh, you can probably cope with uh, a couple of days when you're more or less fasting, but you can't do that every week, every month. You've got to have other resources. Um, I think there's a big um, divide between the people who decide these things and what they think the rest of the community does. I know a lot of wealthy people think that average income in the country is about 40,000 pounds. In truth, it's nearer 20,000. And even if you take average earnings, it may be 26,000. It's nothing like the uh, 40,000 that uh, is often banded around. So in my, in my book, I talk quite a bit about the EU poverty benchmark and um, how, how you can find out about it, uh, the sources of data and so on. And there's another benchmark, because in Loughborough University, the Centre for Research and Social Policy has been uh, putting forward a set of minimum income standards. This is based on focus groups, and they get together people of a similar circumstance, like single pensioners or lone parent with two children, and ask them how much would it uh, take for you to live comfortably, uh, modestly, but not excessively. And they work it out to the nearest pence, and they don't ask for extravagant things like foreign holidays. But latterly, some single parents say that a small car would be useful for taking children to school and that sort of thing. Um, this is, these are slightly more generous than the EU official poverty benchmark. And what I do in this section of the book is say, let's see if we can work out some sample schemes, some which match the current um, benefit levels, others which match the EU official benchmark, and others which try to match the minimum income standards. So I've got three levels of generosity of sample schemes. And in the, these are financed. I, I have a section which says, what sort of ways can you finance this? And I come up with the idea that in, basic income tax is the best way. And I know this is very unpopular, but it's the only income tax that will um, which will re, uh, redistribute income from rich to poor, and it's the only tax that by itself could raise enough money uh, to pay for this, the redistributive income. Yeah, be better. But it could be much fairer. One of the things I dwell on in the book is that there are lots of uh, tax reforms in the income tax system, as in corporation tax. So um, even things like the personal allowance. How many of you realise that every time the government says we're going to increase the personal allowance and what this will do for people, it will, um, a £500 increase in personal allowance will give people on the standard rate of income tax a £100 a year benefit. Those who've got less than that income won't get any benefit, of course. But it's not often realised that those on the higher income tax get double that because the benefit is in accordance to the rate of tax that you're paying. But it doesn't affect people over £100,000 because of the technicality that's built in. 
So every time they increase the personal bounds, it's actually increasing the velocity of people, and it is people with standard brain. So there's a lot wrong with the present system. The tax expenditures, these tax refunds, is often being called um, fiscal welfare. Fiscal means taxation of benefits. So these are the benefits that taxpayers get. And I worked out that the cost of these, because it's uh, the government not collecting the money, um, in the latest year I had, it was worth 235 billion pounds. I'll say that again slowly. 235 billion pounds. In the same year, which was 20, I think it was 2014 to 15, the, uh, the cost of Social Security was 262 billion. It was almost the same order of magnitude. Now, a lot of these tax loopholes are give their people benefit in proportion to their incomes. One of these is pensions, uh, that if people pay into a registered pension scheme, then they will get tax relief. And that tax relief is in proportion to, their, uh, to the income tax rate they pay. So at the most, a person could, a wealthy person could pay um, 40,000 pounds into a registered pension fund, and they will get tax relief at the rate of 45%. So they will get 18,000 pounds bonus, free windfall, when other people are struggling even to get enough pension. The, the state pension is £122 a week, and people who don't have any other income are entitled to apply for pension credit. Now this is a means-tested benefit, and a lot of people, um, they're, they're proud, rightly, that they've never had to ask for help, and, and so they don't, they don't uh, apply for it. And so there are a lot of people with meat monks, means tested benefits, uh, where take up is low. The child benefit, which is the closest we get to a basic income in this country, it's about 98%. For other benefits, it may be something like 65%. So a lot of people not applying for what they're entitled to because of the conditions surrounding it. So if, if we could make the income tax fairer, uh, if we could um, redistribute these tax reports uh, and the social security benefits amongst everybody, there would be plenty enough to pay for um, a basic income scheme. But the details are all in the book. The, these chapters in part three, are, there's a lot of numbers in them. If, if you don't like numbers, miss out chapters 10 to 13 and go straight to chapter 14, which is the uh, illustrated sample schemes, and go look at those. Um, in the, in the uh, chapter C, there's a template for an Excel program, which you can work up yourself on your own computers if you have one, and you can, uh, you can put forward your own scheme and see how much it would cost in terms of an income tax rate if you had a restructured income tax system. Now, um, my friends point out to me that governments are going to uh, just do what I say in my book, of course, but uh, if we're all familiar with what's going on and the unfairness of this and start saying that we want change, not only is the social security system unfair, but so is the income tax system, then perhaps we can start getting some changes in the right direction. What I wanted to do was saying that uh, these schemes are financially viable, even if uh, the powers that be, they make it difficult to actually achieve them. But the more we know about it, the more we are an informed public and can go and see our MPs and our MSPs and say, look, this is the sort of scheme we want, this is the sort of society we want, the more chances that we might get something in the future. There are a few other uh, facts that you may not know of. Uh, for instance, uh, on average, one homeless person dies in the streets every week in this country. I find that absolutely appalling. The government, in its wisdom, had a new system for assessing disability. It used to be on impairment, like if you had a leg missing, you were impaired in your walking, but you could still be functional. Now, but you got a benefit because of the, the impairment. Now it's based on functionality. Can you do something? Madam, can you walk to the, uh, the other side of the room? Yes, but they don't say it takes them half an hour. 
Right, you're able to work of taking you off the benefits. And apparently 1,600 people, disabled people, committed suicide within six months of having their benefits, disablement benefits withdrawn. I don't want to live in that sort of society. And just some other figures about uh, about tax. Well, there are roughly 65 million people in this country, and just over 30 million pay tax. That's less than half. But of course, some of those who don't pay tax are children. We call it dependent children. We define them as between the ages of zero and 15. And there's about uh, roughly 12 million of those in the country, roughly 19 percent. But it still leaves about. Uh, 22 million people have incomes where they don't have enough to pay income tax. Um, and yet, how do they manage? Now, all right, sometimes they are members of the family and there's redistribution within the family, but not always. And a lot of the figures that the government publishes are based on households. And this, this uh, masks a lot of inequality within households. And I would like them to give figures, to actually connect figures and uh, publish figures for individuals and in the individual distribution. Only about uh, 4 million people pay the high rate of tax. And the, this is the last figures I had for the year 2014 to 15. All the new figures are about to come out in the next uh, few weeks, but it's too late for this book. Anyway, I wanted figures that would be relevant for informing people about what could have happened in 2017 to 18. And um, the number of people who paid the um, additional rate, that's over £150,000 um, a year, was 329000 It's probably a lot less than people expect, but it's still a hell of a lot of people. Um, Right. And in, in the book, in the index, I give a lot of figures about um, what the populations are, what the um, GDP, that the general domestic product is, or per capita figures, what income it is. Now, there's a difference between GDP and the sum of income that goes through um, people's purses, wallets, and bank accounts. And uh, the income is about 75% of the GDP. Having Knowing what the average income per head is, uh, which was, I said before, is around 20,000, is useful if you want to base your uh, taxation, your financing the basic income on an income tax. Um, but not every country publishes this. Um, but we can get those sorts of figures, and this is what I'd like to see in the future. Um, so I give a whole lot of figures about what the rates of the main social security benefits are, how much is spent on the uh, social security, how much different taxes raise in revenues and things like that. So people can look up these if they want to play around with the figures. And I do encourage you to work out your own scheme, see how much they would cost. If you can find different ways of financing it, then um, uh, and and publish those or let me know what your figures are doing, I'd be very grateful. I've only concentrated on a simple way. I've left the difficult ways for you to do and let me know about. <laughs> <coughs> and there's a chronology. The appendix C is a chronology about um, the concept of basic income in the UK, which goes back about a hundred years. Um, it goes back further than that. Uh, Thomas Paine in 1795, Thomas Moore in 1516, for instance, had concepts relative to basic income. I think I'm running out of things to say, um, and uh, I think perhaps this would be a good time to start questions. <laughs> Um, where are we politically with this? Have the Green Party adopted this now? And what are the reasons why the Labour Party is not adopting it? And is it one of them that 
Two questions there. First of all, what's the point of the um, In Westminster, um, three years ago, John McDonnell, the Shadow Chancellor, hosted a session on basic income in one of the committee rooms in the House of Commons. They had to move into a bigger room with so many people to come. And uh, he, he was very helpful. We had some good speakers. But he said that at the moment, Social security is so complex that only about six people feel confident about carrying out an, an informed debate about it, and the rest uh, get very nervous. Mm -hmm. However, um, SNP MP uh, Ronnie Cowan was able to was able to um, have a debate in Westminster Hall in September last year, and this is the first debate of basic in Westminster. Now, as far as the parties go, both the Green Party of England and Wales and the Scottish Green Party had it in their manifestos for the last general election. The Scottish Green Party has had a scheme in mind for the last three years. The SNP um, passed a resolution in favour of it in the Spring Conference last year, and I think we've got an interesting support there. Uh, John McDonnell and the Labour Party is in favour of it, as you may have guessed, and I think it's that Jeremy Corbyn is. But they're having to run a fairly delicate route at the moment, so um, I don't know how, how things will go there. But what's interesting is that in Scotland, um, the three councils have wanted to host a basic income pilot scheme. So that's five over the water. City of Glasgow and North Ayrshire. And we have a meeting on Monday when a Scottish official will be there. And I think it's really going to get uh, together today. The three councils want to hold it. Do they have separate schemes or do they coordinate it? Um, what does each of them want to ask and so on? So that's quite exciting. But the interesting thing would be if they think they can get finance. That's the main stumbling block, obviously. Now, the other question was, are governments worried that people will give up work? Well, there's no evidence that people want to give up work. Most people want to work. It's the lack of jobs that's the problem. And the amounts that are um, suggested, even with an EU basic income uh, official poverty benchmark, even if we have that level, it will only just be enough to live on. So there's still always incentives for people to work for their luxuries. But if people do want to withdraw on a minimum income and can manage on that, then I think they're to be commended. They're setting an example of how we could have um, maybe a greener economy and um, be satisfied with a modest living. But most people do want to work because work has lots of benefits. It uh, not only gives you uh, extra earnings, even if you do pay 96 pence in the pound, and it gives you um, social benefits, it's a place to make friends, it gives you a structure to your day, and some jobs even have job satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have been working on this for the last few years in my retirement. <laughs> so, there's no evidence that, uh, that most people will give up work. When they've had basic income to other places around the world, it, it hasn't. It hasn't happened, and I don't see that it's going to be likely to happen. No evidence that people give up work in a mass way if they get a bit of income for nothing. I suppose I just wanted to add to that that in addition to there's no evidence that basic income and business enterprise work, but of course it allows people to contribute to their society and not in other ways. It allows them to embrace lifelong learning, change career. It allows them to mix um, child and caring for older adults. It allows them to have time to volunteer in their community and be active citizens. So I think it's really important in society we also celebrate the contribution of unpaid work. And indeed, um, our government is increasingly thinking how can we solve some of our wicked social issues by having more volunteering? How can we most care is done within families on an unpaid basis? So I think it's really important that we position um, basic income in a way which it looks at how people can have the means to live, do some paid work, but also contribute to societies in other ways, which actually has huge economic value. And if we actually had appropriate measuring of um, that type of economic activity, 
and with GDP doesn't do, I think we'd actually have a much richer picture of our economic and um, uh, activity and our, our social benefits. But it wasn't a question, I just wanted to add to that point about um, work. The national insurance system for unemployment benefits assumes uh, it's really based on the full employment economy, which we haven't entered many decades. And I don't know how it could think people who are on zero hour contracts, are they employed or unemployed? Do they get the benefit? It's not at all clear. And a basic income could solve that problem. And it could lead to a redistribution between those in paid work or an unpaid work at the moment. The society, the government, seems to want people to either work full time or not work at all. And in fact, one of the conditions of getting these tests of benefit is that you can't work, which is really a contradiction. Oh, it's crazy. Um, lady first, and then come to you. I heard that there's um, a scheme set to be rolled out in five on UBI, and I was wondering if you could provide us with some details on that. Um, I think. Where's Corin? <laughs> Would you like to tell us a bit about what's going on in five? Because you don't do. I'm here. It's not clear down the microphone. It came about through, we had a, a, a fair fight commission which had to do to tell the poverty in the area. One of the recommendations was that we should seek to establish a pilot of this income. Um, and we've been having various discussions um, towards that part with people like Annie, who have been assisted in the Scotland. There's a public event that was held in um, Kelty, which Carl Griffith was from Georgetown University, still there. And he, um, through that, we explored some of the practicalities and some of the issues that we need to work through and um, doing that. Also, drawing on things like Guy's Diamond paper on 17 principles that you need to So, we're still at very um, early stages. We've just done um, a survey of uh, public activities, including you know, public people for or against uh, introducing the uh, it's kind of like some better mixed pictures than a third form, third against, third more sure. So we put that public awareness and understanding is a starting point. Um, what I'm currently doing is putting um, together an accessory paper that gives you an identity of this basic income, what are some things that we need to think about, um, what are some of the ethical issues that we need to think about, and what we need to be talking about in, in five. Um, is potentially being a, a saturation pilot, so it would be a whole community. It wouldn't be, say, um, like in Finland, where they've selected um, a number of people at random who are unemployed. It would be everybody within a particular geographic location that would have issues, and it's still going to be a little bit more than that. In the group uh, who are uh, working towards um, implementing this, but there's quite a long way to go yet. Can I link back to the question that you asked about influence and politics? But as you'll be aware, this is a subject matter that's now getting a lot of attention in the USA. And I think one of the concerns that progressive people, including trade unions in this country, have is that in the US it's been picked up with some enthusiasm by libertarian small government people. And the threat, therefore, is that it's seen as a way of cutting back a whole range of select targeted support. Do you see that as a threat? Annie, could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of interest in basic income in the U USA, and part of it is from right wing neoliberals who want to do away with the whole welfare state, including the social security system. But there are others who uh, are in favour of basic income because it could give them the excuse to do away with the, West the rest of the welfare state, including education and health services and so on. 
Now in the book, I say that the right wing of politics is not uniform. So for instance, the extreme right wing wants to do away with all social services, uh, the whole welfare state, and people become um, competitive individuals who pay for their own welfare services and so on. And there's no charity, there's no uh, mutual responsibility. But then the next tranche that is left of them are people who want the social security, want the basic income system, and but they would use that as an excuse to get rid of the, the rest of welfare services. And one of the people who's written about this is a guy called Charles Murray, and uh, from 2006. And um, is it a threat here? I should also say in the USA, there's a lot of interest from people who fear the threat of automation. So there's going to be, there's a small um, uh, pilot study taking place in Oakland, California. Um, is it a threat here? Yes, of course it is. Anybody who wants to get rid of our services is, is a threat. But the way to be that is not to have the system, but to use our democratic process for people to insist that we keep our welfare state. Now that's easy to say. Um, when at the moment our welfare state is being dismantled in front of our eyes, and um, have we got democratic processes to, to deal with it? Well, I think that democracy is something that people have to embrace for themselves and work on. Democracy isn't something you win once and it stays there forever. It has to be worked for and refreshed every time. So where people say, I wouldn't vote for it because the right wingers would bring in uh, yes. the way the welfare state, I would say I would bring it in and I would make sure that I work equally hard for the basic income and for our continuing welfare services. Um, they're not alternatives at all in my mind. I do make that clear in, in the book. Uh, Thomas. Hey, uh, on, on current service, do you have any thoughts on the rule that another very large revenue visa claim it in that? Which, uh, despite the loophole, stands alongside income tax, one of the main revenue earners in the tax. It is, but it's not as much as income tax and. Annie, could you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, have I thought about the sources of income such as VAT, which is a high earner, a high revenue earner? Um, it is high, it's not as high as income tax and national insurance contributions of employees and self employed. And in my restructured system, I would merge those because I don't think they're playing a very differentiated role at the moment. Um, and they wouldn't be if we had a decent basic income scheme. Um, but in, in America, they have a sales tax, which is a, raises greater revenue than VAT. In VAT, people who are registered for that can claim back the VAT that they have paid on things they bought towards their business. So it's a... It's a value added tax rather than sales tax. Now, one of the advantages of having a sales tax is that where you have companies that don't pay income, corporation tax on this company, if you can tax them at source, like for their tax of copy, then that's one way of getting the tax uh, out of the companies. Um, I haven't explored this very much, but uh, I know that some people on the continent have done some studies with VAT and say that it's quite redistributive um, when it's implemented, but I haven't studied that and it's something that I would need to do maybe for a future edition of the book. Is there something you'd like to tell us about it, Thomas? Well, I think if you continue it, you should continue it. It's a little continuing along the back of the That would be good. I was just said that the VAT has got loopholes, including no bet on food, and that too is an issue that has to be looked at. So um, perhaps Thomas, as a former colleague, can help me to work through that. <laughs> I think Anne had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to comment generally, as someone who's been poor for extensive periods of time, and who's been caught between the problem of having part-time work and full-time work, and having to straddle three or four different systems, none of which actually uh, profit me at all. So I've been poor for long periods, and I just want to say that the obsession with poverty is terribly draining in the national resource. When you think about it, and the more um, beneficial things you could be thinking about or doing, but because benefits are so low and the thresholds are so tiny, 
You spend your whole life obsessing about the price of a loaf of bread. So it's a terrible way to <coughs> And it has just pointed out that uh, poverty is a great waste of energy. And it, uh, the figures are that about 20% of the population in this country is below poverty line. And that means 20% of children as well, whose life chances are being diminished by that experience. But yes, uh, poverty is very trailing. The insecurity of it, not knowing whether you're going to have enough money, having to, uh, um, just all the ways you have to cut down, and not only that, the stress can affect your health. And I wonder whether the increased demands on the National Health Service is one of the uh, is caused by this increased stress and anxiety. In my book, I say that some societies seem to operate on the basis of fear and despair, and I want a society that operates on the basis of compassion and justice and trust and hope. And I think basic income is one necessary condition. We need other things too, but a necessary condition for a better society of the type that I heard uh, described this evening. Mm. Any other questions? Very, very Maddie. <laughs> I, I, I looked around to check there wasn't someone else. Mm. <laughs> it's actually just another comment, if that's okay, Annie, because I just wanted to share the fact that um, mm. the UK and long, many yeah. other nations in the world is a signature yeah. to the Convention on Economic and Social Human Rights, mm. and that includes the right to an adequate standard of living. And this actually, um, to me, is something that seems self-evident. Um, as a human being, we have the right not to starve, we have the right to be able to survive, we have the right to open the garbage. And actually, picking up the question earlier about libertarian rights, it's important that those of us who have progressive agendas, that want to affirm the right for a decent and fair society, should be framing basic income in that, as you said, Annie, in that wider space about human rights and what else we need to support it and present our basic income as a foundation to contribute to that just society. And I think it's very dangerous if people who are have progressive views say that because the um, extreme right is supporting this idea, it can't be very good. And there are actually some people on the left who are doing that. So let's actually own this issue and take it forward in the way that we want to in the UK and so on. Just to repeat, Maddie. Uh, Mandy has pointed out that uh, the United Nations Declaration, the, the United Nations Declaration, the Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, puts forward the right for um, a, a living which keeps people out of poverty. And this is another thing we should be claiming from our government. Why aren't they operating? Uh, and they keep saying, oh, we, we paid six months to this cause and something else, and why aren't we satisfied? It's, uh, um, they really ought to be called to account far more. Um, I think I'm about to end my time. Oh, what the name? Now that gets I think I'd like to repeat the fact that about the sort of society I would like to be in. One that's based on compassion, justice, trust, trust in people. I get the feeling that people who run the country don't trust anybody else. Is it um, they don't seem to empathise with other people? Are they all sociopaths? Um, are they all misogynists? Um, I mean, don't quote me on this. <laughs> um, I wonder what sort of lives they live and why they aren't, don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. It's about time they didn't know. I hope that some of them will read my book and find out. So, thank you very much, everyone. everyone next door who's been incredibly patient um, with us and we're just a few months into this and we're still, um, we've got some new problems on the website already. But everyone is here and everyone got to hear it, which is marvellous. And if you're next door, you can be the rest of the book signing. <laughs> um, so if, if uh, those who are on the site can keep their seats for just a wee moment, and those who are standing, if you want to make your way next door, 
and Annie is going to, uh, if we can sort of have a parting of the Red Sea, so that Annie can make her way around, and as I say, she will be next door, you can ask any questions you want to text to, and get your book signed, um, and so while she makes her way up, we all look at me and say another big thank you to Annie. Thank you.